Okay, so we're just um, a minute after the hour here. I think we can probably get started. Um, if others join later, that's okay. Uh, thank you again for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Robin Nicholson and I'm an intern with Research Data Canada. And we are very happy to present part two of our series on the Research Data Alliance COVID-19 guidelines and recommendations on data sharing. Today's webinar will be focused on navigational tools and other outputs. Today's session is a follow-up to a previous webinar we hosted last month on August 12th, which was co-presented by RDC Executive Director Mark Leggett and Director of the Digital Repository of Ireland, Natalie Harrower, who both served as co-chairs of the RDA COVID-19 Working Group and previously provided us with an introduction and overview of the guidelines and recommendations and their impact. The recording and slides from part one are also available on the RDC website uh, on the archived webinars page, so you can check that out for sure. Uh, please note that this session, both the audio and video, is being recorded and will also be made available on RDC's website along with the slides. So, as mentioned, part two today will focus on the navigational tools and other outputs that have resulted from the RDA COVID-19 recommendations and guidelines on data sharing. The DOI link on this slide will take you to the final version of the recommendations and guidelines document for further reference. As you can see on the agenda here, we will be providing a brief summary of the recommendations and guidelines document and move on to a discussion of the additional navigational tools, such as an infographic, outputs card, Zotero library, data stewardship wizard, and mind map, along with supplementary outputs and journal articles that are also in the works. The next couple of slides will just cover some general housekeeping for today's session before we get started. So here are the links to the slide deck we will be using today, both in English and in French, if you'd like to follow along. Um, we are also happy to note that today's session features both English and French audio channels via Zoom's simultaneous interpretation feature. To access this feature, simply select the interpretation output on the right hand side of your Zoom menu to select your preferred language. The recording of this session along with the slides will be made available in both French and English. Uh, I will mention that this is actually our first time offering simultaneous interpretation for webinar, so we would deeply appreciate any feedback on the experience from any of our French listeners today. We will be putting up a live poll at the end of today's session to inquire whether you used the French channel and whether you were satisfied with the service. Please feel free to reach out to Mark or myself with other additional feedback. Our contact information is on a slide near the end of the session. Uh, we would also ask that if you have any questions of the presenters today, please enter them in the Q&A box to allow us to better keep track. The Q&A option can be found at the bottom of your Zoom screen in your menu. We will be monitoring questions as they come in and time will be allotted at the end of the session to answer them in the order in which they were entered. Uh, I will now get ready to pass things over to our presenters for today. As mentioned, Mark Leggett is the Executive Director of Research Data Canada and also served as one of the seven co-chairs of the Research Data Alliance COVID-19 Working Group. He also served as a chair of the Visualization Team subgroup who worked on most of the navigational tools we will be covering today. Rob Hooft is Program Manager of Data Stewardship, among other titles, uh, with the Dutch Tech Center for Life Sciences. He also served as a co-moderator for the OMICS subgroup of the RDA COVID-19 Working Group and also worked with Mark on the visualization team with particular involvement with the Data Stewardship Wizard, which we will explore later on. Mark will be starting us off here, so over to you, Mark. All right, thanks, Robin. And uh, an extra thanks to Robin, who uh, does a lot of the work for RDC's webinars. And uh, if I get a chance and I remember at the end, I'll highlight uh, a couple of the ones that we have coming up. Uh, next slide. So I'm just going to briefly um, do a quick summary because I suspect a number of the people uh, who've called in today will have uh, listened in to earlier webinars, either RDC's or RDA webinars. So just a bit of background on the recommendations and guidelines. 
So they uh, had their uh, start from a request from the European Commission to RDA to develop guidelines around data sharing in the COVID-19 context. Uh, that happened uh, back in March and then uh, by early April, a working group had been set up and uh, the decision was made to focus on four research areas, which I'll highlight shortly, as well as four cross-cutting themes. Um, and then we also had um, co-moderators for each of those eight groups and, uh, and then a series of teams uh, aside from those eight uh, theme areas that focused on the editorial task of pulling all the eight different voices and documents together, the visualization effort that uh, Robin mentioned and something uh, called Zotero, which I'll also mention shortly. So after uh, five uh, releases, the uh, six releases, including the final one, over three months, the final document was released June 30th. And uh, as you'll uh, hear uh, briefly in a, in a bit, um, the, the process was quite <laughs> exhausting and exhilarating. And there's actually a paper coming up that will describe that process. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just as a bit of a reminder, um, so the goal was, again, with the uh, COVID-19 in mind, but also infectious disease uh, in the broader context, uh, you know, what are the challenges that we're facing with, uh, in terms of uh, affecting efficient sharing and timely sharing of research data? So that was our, our, uh, our focus. Uh, the interoperability of that data was key, as was things like standards and properly documenting the research outputs and uh, achieving a high degree of reusability. Next slide. Um, so the objectives, uh, and sometimes it's a little confusing because we call them recommendations and guidelines. So there's a large part of the document which uh, we call guidelines, which are rec uh, guidelines for researchers that want to share their data. Uh, so that's the part of the document that we call the guidelines. Uh, and then there's also a set of recommendations, uh, which are briefer sections in the document, but those are targeting policymakers and publishers and, and funders and infrastructure providers as uh, the people that support those researchers. Uh, next slide. So with those objectives in mind, um, the group uh, came up with a set of recommendations, uh, only a few of which are highlighted here. So I'm not going to go through these. I'll just mention two. Um, recommendation one, uh, which is a personal uh, interest as well as something that Research Data Canada is quite involved with, and that is the cross-jurisdictional effort to foster global open science uh, through policy and investment. Uh, and then item three, uh, which is, a, again, a personal as well as a professional focus is a recommendation to invest in state-of-the-art IT around data management, um, not just the infrastructure, but also people. So lots of uh, key recommendations, some of them like these, very high level, and others, as you'll find out uh, shortly, very, uh, very detailed. Next slide. So just to reiterate, the, the four thematic areas were clinical omics, uh, meaning genomics or metabolomics, uh, different forms of of uh, the science of omics, epidemiology, and the social sciences. And then there were what we call cross-cutting or uh, common themes, those being community participation, research software, uh, indigenous peoples and or indigenous data, and legal and ethical considerations. So those are the kind of the eight core sections in the guidelines and recommendations, along with a kind of an overarching text that tried to pull the common elements across all of those eight areas. Next slide. Um, so with that effort, um, you, we saw, see the result of the different sections. I'm just going to get, because uh, Rob was one of the co-chairs or co-moderators of the OMIC subgroup. Maybe, Rob, did you want to say a few words about the sample? 
Yeah, so uh, of course, this is uh, only a small sample of the hundreds of links actually that uh, were completely in the uh, in the omics chapter. There were about 40 people involved in weekly uh, meetings uh, trying to draft this all together. Uh, of course, also uh, working on this uh, on their own time uh, outside of our meetings. Um, um, not only did these people uh, work as experts in the omics field, but also they contributed significantly to the, uh, the generic overview of, uh, of recommendations, such as the, uh, the fair and timely uh, chapter in the, uh, in the document. Um, there are a, a, so this is the gene expression data. Uh, you see uh, also there are several other fields uh, uh, where the omics have been uh, working on. So there is the uh, virus uh, genetics, uh, human genetics. There is a special section on immunogenetics. There are proteomics and metabolomics uh, uh, chapters in there. Uh, structural uh, genomics as well. And uh, there is a separate section on uh, lipidomics because this field, subfield of metabolomics is so important for this specific virus. So for each of these fields, we had the people, uh, the experts work on the documentation of the right, doc the right repositories to put the data, uh, the right formats, to use for those repositories and also the right metadata schemas that are suitable for these uh, for these data types. Uh, this was, uh, of course, uh, many of the researchers are uh, aware of these, but some of it uh, was really seen frustratingly that uh, a number of the papers uh, that were very quickly appearing in the early days of the uh, of the pandemic uh, were published on uh, pre. Uh, 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 preprint servers uh, and actually mentioned data sets, but those made data sets were either in locked repositories or not uh, findable at all. So this is uh, this is also why, as the omics group, we contributed significantly to uh, to fair. Yeah, as I said, to in total there are hundreds of links that are directly towards the resources people will need if they are using these recommendations. And of course, there are also uh, some extra recommendations for the funders, publishers, and infrastructure providers in the omics chapter. Back to you, Mark. All right, thanks, Rob. Uh, next slide. Um, and again, this is an example of one of the uh, cross-cutting themes, this in this case, uh, legal and ethical uh, issues. Uh, this is the section on consent. And the one thing I would highlight here, this, uh, this section of the guidelines and recommendations document would not be as rich in terms of links as the one that Rob just mentioned, uh, but it's very rich in terms of the, uh, the kind of advice uh, and its connection to what I would call more national or localized um, regulations and, and uh, context. So a very important piece about the legal and ethical was that the team had to kind of um, make recommendations at a higher level than might be immediately uh, recognizable or relevant to researchers in individual jurisdictions. Uh, but so, and I wanted to highlight that because I want to kind of have those that are listening hold on to that thread because when, after Rob describes the, what we did with the DS wizard, one of the goals that we have uh, using the legal and ethical context as well as national or localized examples of data repositories in areas such as omics, because we're hoping that people would take the DS wizard tool uh, and clone it and add additional layers that reflect specific recommendations related to specific domain or uh, jurisdictional context. So that was a very important um, uh, reason for doing a tool like the DS Wizard was to kind of give uh, the guidelines and recommendations uh, greater life beyond that original uh, released version and hopefully a richer uh, future set of guidelines and recommendations. Next slide. Um, so that's again a, a quick summary of the guidelines and recommendations uh, writ large. Uh, next slide. So now Rob and I are going to talk about uh, the additional 
tools that were made available. Um, and one as it will look familiar because I used it in for the previous slides uh, is an infographic uh, that was developed um, by Robin and the designer is uh, Christina, who's uh, also on the call here and works for the parent organization of Research Data Canada, uh, Canary. Um, so it's a uh, it's a generalized, high-level kind of one-page summary into the guidelines and recommendations. And as you can see on the right, in the Canadian context, we took the opportunity to translate that. Uh, into French to facilitate again the uh, the opportunity for colleagues uh, in our French communities to um, uh, to get that kind of high level access into the guidelines and recommendations. So we would certainly encourage others that wish to translate at least the infographic. Uh, and if you have an interest in translating it to other um, languages, then just uh, let us know and we can provide uh, the uh, the raw file so that you to facilitate that translation. Uh, next slide. Um, RDA, uh, this will be familiar, familiar to those of you that are uh, familiar with the RDA. Uh, when outputs are created by the RDA community, then these uh, output cards are created. Uh, so this is, again, a way to provide an easy access into the guidelines and recommendations. And as you can tell by the QR code, it's also intended to be typically printed out as a single uh, sheet, double-sided, uh, again, that's something that could be handed out uh, at an event or to a community of colleagues. Next slide. And both those, inf the, the infographic, English and French, and the uh, output cards are available uh, through the main uh, RDA COVID-19 uh, URL that was uh, listed earlier. Um, uh, one of the key challenges in a couple of hundred people all contributing to the same textual guidelines, aside from managing that process of writing that textual uh, material, there's also that challenge. Imagine the challenge you yourself have of, have of keeping track of hundreds of uh, bibliographic references uh, with the URLs to the canonical documents. And when it's just one person, that's uh, a challenge in itself. But with over a thousand entries uh, being contributed by a couple of hundred uh, colleagues, uh, it was important to use a tool that would facilitate not just the management of those references, but also their subsequent inclusion uh, and management in the text. So we chose a, a freely available tool called Zotero. It's from a family of bibliographic management software tools uh, facilitated that process. Um, there um, are, I believe it's in a, over 700 citations are in the guidelines and recommendations themselves. So there are additional citations in the Zotero library that aren't in the guidelines. Um, there's about 20 or 30 people that are currently um, maintaining that Zotero library and the, the intention is to uh, update it going forward. Um, you can easily use the link that's provided there uh, to get a, that'll take you to a kind of an explanation page about the Zotero library uh, that Claire Austin, who was the lead on the Zotero piece, maintains. And once you open that up, either in the web version or, or application version of Zotero, then you can uh, copy and, and uh, make those citations uh, or add those citations to your own local collection. Next slide. So it's a very useful tool. Um, this is a, not all that readable, but the intention there was to show that there's not just a full listing of the 1100 citations, but also each of the um, eight uh, subgroups has a separate collection and folders. Um, and there are additional tags, again, hard to see on the screen on the lower left that kind of indicate um, the the area of those particular citations. Uh, each citation uh, would be accompanied with a link. Uh, again, when it was available, a DOI link uh, to take you to that uh, canonical document. So this is the web interface in the next slide. Very similar looking, but this is the desktop client. Uh, 
So the same view of the same list. And on the next slide uh, is just an example of uh, from the Word, Microsoft Word interface, um, invoking the Zotero plugin and typing in uh, a search term and then choosing the article and pasting it into the into the Word document. So aside from managing the citations and making them shareable or accessible uh, in a public context, it, they're also in a tool that can be immediately uh, made available and, and, and made useful by people that are uh, writing documents and want to make use of the references. And of course, as the tarot uh, references can be exported uh, in any number of other bibliographic manager formats. So whether you're using this or Mendeley or a reference manager or whatever your preferred tool is, um, if you want to make use of the citations, uh, then that would be the way to go. And again, our goal is um, if people find important um, references that they feel would be useful or of interest to the community, then we would certainly be happy to either have you submit those for inclusion or contact Clara Austin uh, and ask to be included in the list of uh, maintainers for that library. So that's the Zotero uh, database. Next slide. And I'm going to pass it over to Rob because Rob is the wizard on the DS with me. Uh, actually, I am making use of my colleagues in the Czech Republic who are the real wizards of the wizard, but I am uh, the content uh, wizard of the, uh, the data stewardship wizard as it was originally. And I'll uh, explain a little bit how this, uh, how this came to be at a later, uh, on a later slide. So the, the goal of the wizard in this uh, context is that uh, to make the content uh, findable, re readable by people who uh, need to uh, be exposed to exactly those pieces of content that apply to them. And not the, the original document, the 150 pages that was created by the whole working group, uh, contains uh, for uh, content for different target audiences. Uh, and actually, this, these target audiences are not uh, split uh, into the different chapters. Actually, the different chapters each contain individual uh, recommendations for different target audiences. The idea of the, of the wizard would be to ask a few questions from a user and just select only those parts of the 150 pages of the documentation that is available uh, that apply to the situation that you're in. And uh, in the end, the goal then is that what you have selected can be downloaded as your own private PDF that contains exactly that. And so the link to the wizard is here, uh, and it recently uh, was complete enough uh, to uh, to be shared with a, with a larger audience. Uh, but there, as I will show, there is also a way for you to to give us feedback about uh, uh, how it behaves and the way this uh, is organized, so that you can help us to improve it for uh, for other uh, people as well. So on the next slide. Yeah, you see the welcome page and the welcome page uh, contains a few uh, instructions and I will go through those instructions so you don't need to read them now. But if you create an, uh, an account on here, this will be a, a necessary step uh, and to confirm it via an email, uh, then you will be able to log into uh, to this system and then uh, create what is called your own questionnaire uh, on the next slide. Uh, you will see if you've clicked on the, uh, the option to, uh, to go to a questionnaires and then click on the option create, then you can actually go to this uh, sheet. You uh, type a name for your own uh, questionnaire. Uh, you type your, uh, your name or your uh, uh, particular uh, interest. Um, and then you select under knowledge model the uh, COVID-19 recommendations. There are no other ones at the moment, uh, but at some point there may be a choice uh, between uh, localized versions. As uh, Mark already uh, said, maybe there will be versions that are specifically tailored for specific uh, countries or uh, jurisdictions. The rest of the options at this moment you can uh, can ignore. Uh, so at the bottom of this page, you will find a an actual create uh, button. So if we go to the next slide, 
then uh, you will see uh, how it will look after that. So this is your uh, personal uh, uh, view, uh, your personal uh, questionnaire. Um, the questionnaire is selected into different chapters and each chapter has a, a few questions in there uh, that will help you to select the parts of the guidelines that are applicable to certain subgroups of, uh, of these target audiences. Um, uh, if you, you look at uh, the, the, the questions, so if you, uh, it's on the next slide, uh, please. Uh, you see that each question is uh, often uh, answered by no or yes. Uh, here you see a little icon after the yes. And uh, if you click this yes, this icon means more questions actually uh, will occur. Um, in this case here, uh, this is fine. Uh, yeah. So more, more questions will occur if you, if you select an answer. And um, once you select an answer, the applicable uh, uh, guidelines will actually show up in a little uh, shaded box, like here, the, the sections 2.2.5 and 2.2.6 out of the recommendations are applicable in this case and have selected. Um, each question has a little plus on the uh, on the margin and if you click that plus you can actually give us feedback about this question and uh, feel free to use this for any kind of feedback and uh, including the uh, the text but also the structure of the questionnaire on the next slide um, then uh, once you've done everything, you see here uh, under the chapters that there are tick marks everywhere. All the questions have been answered. Uh, you can actually uh, turn this into your own uh, PDF. So you've uh, been able to read it all off screen uh, in the uh, shaded boxes. But here, if you click on create document, uh, then uh, you can actually go, uh, and on the next slide it will show uh, the, the form that will occur then. Uh, uh, create a PDF document that contains exactly those shaded boxes with the context that was there. One thing that I would like to stress is that this, this whole system has been made to uh, answer complex questionnaires. So there is no order in which you have to fill in all the questions and you can also print it out or make, make this PDF uh, even if you've not completed the, the questionnaire. Uh, so feel free to, uh, to use it in any order that you feel uh, fit. So uh, if you're on the next slide, uh, uh, then you see uh, this is how uh, the uh, unit, the, the, the thing was created. So in the back end for uh, normally data stewards here, uh, you can see that this knowledge model has the, uh, the different questions. Each question has the yes and the no answer. And under each answer, we have selected the, uh, the sections with the right uh, applicable uh, uh, notes in there. So here you see highlighted a question, a, a chapter, one of the chapters, and in this chapter there is some explanatory text from the chapter. In the next slide you will actually see a question and an answer that have been selected and the guidance that we've selected from this answer. So uh, in here uh, you will be able to edit uh, uh, at, if you are so inclined, would be able to edit the uh, the actual questionnaire. And that is what uh, Mark already said earlier. This way it is possible to actually localize the guidance for the people that uh, may be in uh, an institute that you are, uh, um, where you are uh, supporting the researchers, uh, that the researchers actually find not these, just the worldwide guidance, but actually find the uh, location of the, uh, the resources and the people in your institute that they would need for these uh, specific sections. And uh, if there would be changes that we make to the, uh, the base knowledge model, then you would be able to take over those changes in your own localized version as well. So uh, on the next slide, I am uh, summarizing uh, where the data stewardship wizard comes from. You can guess it a little bit from the name. So it was originally uh, built to make, uh, to guide uh, 
researchers and data stewards in making a data management plan. Uh, and uh, that started from the idea of a, a 600 node mind map. Uh, and a 600 node mind map that contained a lot of information on how to do data management well. But of course, uh, navigating a 600 node mind map uh, uh, can be rather tedious if you are trying to figure out what the best options for your uh, data management plan are. So we actually tried to make this tool uh, as a way to present this, uh, this knowledge model of uh, data management expertise uh, for a, the target audience of a researcher who wants to make a data management plan and to help the data the, with this data management plan, the actual project uh, going forward. Um, this uh, uh, system uh, uh, is really suitable, therefore, for presenting uh, a guidance to, uh, to people, and that's why we repurposed it here for the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, work. Uh, this whole system is also available for download, so if you would want to host either your own questionnaires or uh, the whole thing as a data management plan creator, then uh, you can also do that in your own uh, environment, your own premises. And uh, with that, uh, I, I would like to give it back to Mark. Yeah, so and I would um, highlight again, if you are uh, interested in creating a a variation on the main recommendations and guidelines, uh, again, from a national or jurisdictional or domain perspective. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and uh, do what we can to help and facilitate that. Uh, the goal would be to have the core guidelines kind of maintained in the original context and then enriched and uh, enlarged, as we said, or, or sections of that uh, to reflect uh, other interests, uh, as we said. So uh, happy to hear from you on that one. Um, so the uh, next tool we're going to talk about uh, briefly is a mind map version. So this is a, a single broad view in a typical mind map uh, context. Uh, it includes all of the content of the recommendations and guidelines, including the, the glossary and, and acronym list and uh, and uh, other uh, bits and pieces. Um, despite the fact that it's intended to be a high level view, clearly it gives you access not just to the individual as we, the term we tended to use was atomistic uh, bits from the guidelines and recommendations. It also al allows you to search through those using full text. Uh, and you can also filter uh, and just view those things having to do with data sharing or epidemiology or uh, a combination of tags. So it does give you a little um, more flexibility in terms of how you do that. Uh, if you access uh, the URL there, you'll be uh, provided with an HTML5 uh, version of the uh, mind map, uh, which we will update uh, periodically based on feedback with, that we receive or corrections in the uh, document itself. Uh, next slide. So this is the uh, web-based interface. Um, on the right-hand side, the sequence of blue boxes uh, starts with the objectives and foundational elements and then goes down, as you will probably remember from Rob's uh, DS Wizard presentation that there separates out the guidelines for researchers, policymakers, funders, and then rolling up onto the left, uh, publishers uh, and data sharing in uh, infrastructures and the community participation piece. Um, the additional outputs, um, as I said, includes all of the other textual components, including um, the acronym list, the glossary, the bibliography is uh, duplicated in the mind map. So if you're looking for a particular citation uh, that's mentioned in one of the text snippets, then you can easily um, search for it uh, in the bibliographic uh, attachment. Uh, next slide. Uh, so what this shows is that uh, the user has clicked on the filter icon in the upper right. And in this case, they've selected epidemiology. And then what that does is it makes only those uh, components of the guidelines and recommendations that were specific to epidemiology. 
uh, viewable. And then uh, I think there might be another slide, <laughs> Robin. Uh, so here I've clicked on one of the uh, end nodes or one of the nodes. In this particular one, it's guidelines for creating instruments to capture data. Uh, so that pops out a note uh, box, which again shows that actual snippet of the guidelines and recommendations along, uh, including the, uh, the hot links uh, to the items. Uh, for some of the, the nodes, there are additional uh, uh, URL links uh, that represent uh, material that wasn't part of the, the text snippet. So there are, are a few of those as well. And uh, what I don't show here again is the ability to, uh, to do a full text search. So again, the, the goal here, uh, and I didn't show the, the full mind map because uh, it, it would be as unreadable as um, some of the other slides <laughs> I had put in or more unreadable, um, but it is uh, available now in a public view. Uh, if anybody has any comments or corrections, uh, we would be quite happy to hear from you and, and uh, make those corrections so that the, uh, the product is accurate. Next slide. Um, so that was it for the two, two of the key navigational uh, tools that were prepared by the, what we call the visualization or decision tree team. Um, so I'm just going to briefly highlight some of the other um, additional outputs and uh, components that were created as a result of this effort. And uh, again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to uh, type them in in the Q&A. Uh, so as a result, um, as you can imagine, one of the challenges that the editorial team had in cr cr crafting the final document was trying to take these eight separate sections and pull out kind of the common threads that were moved up into one of the first sections, uh, try to common co uh, arrive at a common language so that the text read uh, as a single narrative. Uh, but the other piece was what could come out, what, what should go into the, the released final version of the uh, guidelines and recommendations and what was kind of a level of detail that was maybe too much. Um, as a result of that decision, some of the subgroups have separate supplementary outputs. And in order to kind of go into be classed as a supplementary output, then that subgroups efforts go through the same RDA uh, approval process that any uh, RDA group goes through. So there is a separate data sharing and epidemiology output. Some of the subgroups have also, uh, and these links are in the final published uh, document. Some of the subgroups were also made the Google folders that they used during their working process. Uh, so that would include uh, the notes of their calls as well as uh, in some cases, uh, unfinalized or unpublished versions of the uh, detailed, more detailed documents. So that's one kind of th thing that we call supplementary outputs. There's also a set of journal articles uh, that are being prepared. One is a summary of the findings. Um, and another one is a description of the process that was used to create the, the recommendations and guidelines. So more of that kind of social, technical, uh, community aspect of the, the process um, and how that worked and, uh, and maybe some of the things that didn't work as well. And the community participation team, because that, um, that was a very challenging piece to kind of integrate in, given its broad nature and interdisciplinary nature, uh, they're also working on an article. Uh, there's also been a few already published summaries of the, of the guidelines and RECs. Uh, there's just a few example links there to one in uh, the, the journal Cell. Uh, they have, um, the Cell Journal has uh, another uh, special journal called Patterns uh, or section called Patterns and the Healthcare IT News is two examples. Uh, next slide. Um, there have also been a series of endorsements and statements. So various stakeholders that uh, are uh, willing or desirous of promoting the guidelines and recommendations to their specific communities, um, whether it's uh, publishers or funders or 
policymakers. So just a few statements that are linked to there, one from STM Publishers, which represents a lot of the large, uh, especially STEM and uh, publishers. Uh, GITA, the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, uh, and the uh, Duty to Document Statement, which was a joint statement that was produced during the COVID-19 pandemic and is um, produced by uh, colleagues in the uh, archival community. Next slide. Um, there's also a host, uh, probably uh, a few dozen at this point, uh, webinars, events, RDC. This is uh, the second one uh, that RDC has done. Uh, RDC is also doing one um, uh, for a community in Canada that's called the Can COVID Slack channel. So it's a Slack channel that has uh, over 3,000 researchers mostly uh, that are doing research into the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, so we're doing a special webinar for that group. Uh, other organizations, RDA clearly has had uh, a number of um, presentations, both uh, from regional uh, nodes like uh, RDA Ireland, but also um, from R RDA itself. Uh, other organizations affiliated or not with um, RDA, such as uh, FAPSEP from Brazil, the European Open Science Forum, and the Scottish Council on Archives, and those are links to the webinars. Um, one of the other things that's happening that's not quite ready yet is uh, we're working on an impact survey. And the intention with that is to try to distribute that broadly to all of those various stakeholder communities that you've seen highlighted in our uh, screenshots and try to get a sense of the impacts uh, of the guidelines and recommendations in the short term, but also uh, what are the other things that uh, the RDA community can do to improve on on uh, either those specific guidelines and recommendations or similar ones for the future. Next slide. So that uh, that impact survey uh, should be coming out in the next few weeks. Uh, many of you will know that RDA has uh, a twice twice a year plenary. Um, the previous one was in Melbourne in March, uh, which became a virtual plenary uh, because it fell right at the uh, beginning of the uh, challenges with travel uh, as we uh, as the pandemic evolved. Um, so the next one is in early November, as you can see from the uh, image, 9th to 12th of November. It was to be held uh, physically in Costa Rica, but this one will also be a virtual plenary. Um, and there is, for example, a, uh, a number of meetings of the groups within that context, uh, which will include sessions, uh, a session for the COVID-19 working group itself, uh, the epidemiology group that has gathered together to look at creating a, a separate epidemiology working group is having a session. Uh, there's an infectious disease, birds of a feather, uh, which is one of the goals of that is to consider creating a broader uh, kind of encompassing umbrella for efforts related to infectious disease and not just COVID-19. And there's also a community partic uh, participation, birds of a feather, which will focus on that uh, community participation citizen science piece. So I would encourage you to um, register for the 16th plenary. Uh, the RDA community, as you can imagine, um, with, you know, within two weeks having gathered 600 people together to work on the COVID-19 guidelines is a very um, responsive and uh, it's a great community. So I would encourage that. Uh, next slide. So this is kind of the, we call this the value of RDA for COVID-19. This is uh, the main landing page that I would typically send somebody to uh, who has, might have questions about the guidelines and recommendations. Uh, and this lists additional material like journal publications, webinars, as well as providing the links to the, uh, the published guidelines in uh, Zenodo. So this is the, probably the best URL to use if you want to share out uh, the results of the RDA community's efforts. Um, next slide. 
And maybe just to, um, to highlight again, we didn't um, have say too much about RDA itself as a, as a community, uh, but I should um, certainly encourage everyone that's on this call, if you're not an RDA member, to consider becoming one. It's, it's free. Uh, RDA is a community of committed individuals. Uh, it's also a platform, uh, both a, a software platform and a virtual uh, people platform. Uh, that facilitates the kinds of things that you can see through this COVID-19 effort. Um, it's, as I said, it's a very engaged community, very committed. There's over a hundred interest groups and working groups. Uh, interest groups are the, the term that's given to a group that meets every uh, twice a year and in between those with additional calls to talk about things of interest. Uh, an example might be uh, blockchain in the health uh, health fields, um, whereas working groups uh, are groups that are formed around a specific uh, focus or a specific lens through which uh, the members of the working group gather in order to produce an output, typically within an 18-month timeline. Uh, so to see the effort of the COVID-19 working group uh, materialize in this outcome in a much shorter time frame uh, is, uh, is a substantial achievement. This communities of practice uh, group type that I mentioned is one that's being actively developed uh, to encourage broader um, participation from a broader community around a particular, for example, domain could be one of the sustainable development goals. Uh, any of these kinds of things that uh, tend to reach into multiple disciplines, uh, multiple levels of, uh, of society uh, and different types of uh, stakeholder. So maybe just the final thing, you'll see the RDA's guiding principles there on the side, openness, consensus, balance, harmonization, community driven and nonprofit and technology neutral. Um, so I certainly, uh, you know, I joined RDA's council as a co-chair together with my colleague Ingrid Dillo because these are guiding principles that um, are front and center for me and have been for a long time in my professional career. So uh, it's certainly uh, RDA is a group that has resonated uh, quite strongly with me and uh, many of my colleagues here in Canada. Uh, next slide. Uh, so that's it for us for content. Um, there's some additional contact info there if you want to ask a general question of the RDA team. That's uh, where you would use that inquiries at rdalliance.org. Uh, the website, the Twitter handle is there. Um, and then our individual contact uh, info, including our Twitter handles are available uh, down below. Uh, so maybe we'll just leave this slide up, or is there one more slide, Robin? Ah, the uh, collaborators, uh, the members of the uh, visualization team that helped uh, produce the uh, efforts that we just described. Uh, so I certainly we can hover over on this, stay on this slide for a bit. Uh, that uh, long number after each name is not a credit card, that's an ORCID. <laughs> ID. Um, so whenever possible, I think the RDA community members try to practice what we preach. Um, so when you look at the list of larger list of contributors to the guidelines and recommendations, it's very rare to see a name that doesn't have an ORCID associated with it. So that was uh, quite nice to see. Um, just in terms of RDC itself, and Robin can jump in and correct me if I get any of this wrong. Uh, our upcoming webinars include a five part series on data ownership. Uh, so this will dive into the details of IP and ownership of data, uh, specifically research data, and talk about it from typical uh, traditional university college research perspective. So both um, applied research and, um, and uh, uh, university research. Um, we will have uh, members of uh, 
our uh, indigenous communities in Canada on a panel. Um, we were also going to talk about the, the link between data ownership and open science. So a number of, of good topics on, on the uh, data ownership coming up. And we're also working with our colleagues at the Portage Network here in Canada uh, and uh, colleagues that can, uh, wrote the Trust Principles, which is an important emerging set of principles that I think are a fine sibling to the FAIR principles. Uh, so we're co-hosting an upcoming uh, Canadian focused webinar on the Trust Principles. Uh, and then we're also working with the Portage Network colleagues and the Canadian Research Knowledge Network, uh, as well as a few other uh, colleague organizations on a series on PIDs, persistent IDs. So lots of content coming uh, between now and December. So that's it for me. I don't know, Robin or Rob, if either one of you wanted to add anything, if we wait to see if there's any questions. I can just only reiterate the uh, the pleasure it is to work with a fantastic team in the RDA. Uh, this has not been my first and my only experience in uh, working in RDA with, with a, a group of people, but it has been always a very inclusive uh, uh, community. Thanks, Rob. Robin, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think that that is more than covered it for me. Um, was the goal to do the poll for the, those on the call who may be using it in the French channel? Sure, we could use that opportunity right now. It's probably a good time to do that now. <laughs> so this is the first time we've uh, put on a, a webinar in RDC using the simultaneous interpretation feature. And I'm not actually sure if anybody used it during this call, but if you did, um, both Anthony, our interpreter for today, and RDC would uh, be interested in hearing about your experience. So I think there's a poll either in front of you or coming your way. And there it is. So if you do get a chance to respond to the poll, um, that would be great. Uh, are there any questions while we wait for that? Well, it looks like we had at least one person use the French interpretation. Um, so that's a good sign. One is worth it. Um, and maybe just to reiterate, as Robin suggested, the webinar will be, has been recorded and we'll make it available along with links to the slides. And uh, we're also, um, are experimenting with recording the French channel at the same time as the English, so we'll see if that works. And if it does, we'll make both of those available. I'll just go ahead and, and close that poll. Um, but like I say, if you have other feedback as far as the interpretation service is concerned, feel free to contact Mark or myself. So thanks so much for your feedback. Yeah, thanks everyone for attending and uh, thanks uh, for the comments that were just put in chat and Q&A, including a helpful comment on the nature of the poll. <laughs> and so I guess that's it. Uh, Robin and I don't think we can. I don't think we can stay after to work on the translation piece because once we stop the webinar, then I think it closes, right? Yes. Okay. Um, 
So Anthony, I don't know if you want to pop back into the the general channel, but and we can discuss the recording piece. But uh, I don't think we can actually you can actually do anything until we're done. Uh, I think you want to stop the sharing, Robin. Sure. Um, yeah, we may as well. I'm pretty sure if you end the broadcast, then that will close the webinar, right? I think, it will, we'll, end, I think it will end everything. It'll end everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, so once this, uh, once we close the webinar, Anthony, you should be presented with a. Uh, a window in your desktop interface that will ask if you want to start the rendering of the video as slash audio. So if uh, you get it, if you get that, then um, you can render that and then just let Robin or I know and we can let you know how to best transfer the file because it might be large. And uh, otherwise, I think we're good to go. Okay. Thanks right. so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Right. Cheers.